Hello everyone, this is Vince 12 tying in again, and welcome once again to Random Apostle Critiques. And I'm posting this rather soon, uh, in space between the last one. I said I would do this a little bit frequently, a little bit more frequently than a lot of my other videos, but I say that I say that not necessarily because it's something that I'm doing for the Inquisition. More so, this is one of the easiest types of videos I can put out. <laughs> like, uh, all I have to really do is read the story as series I can to the best of my ability and judge it at the end. And since I'm a lazy bastard and editing is a foreign concept to me, it's very appealing to me uh, since I don't have to do that much editing. But you're not here to talk to hear me talk about the quote-unquote technical aspect of these uh, videos, so let's just jump right into this story. The Nanny of Ellie Boyce, and uh, for newcomers, I'm also going to say... You know, the, the title is pretty much self-explanatory. I click the random pasta. I read whatever I come up, as long as it's not too short. And whatever comes up, I read it, and I critique it at the end. Basically, this is just me trying to evaluate the con the content on the creepypasta wiki and see what slipped through the cracks, or, hey, you never know, maybe we're we found a hidden gem that deserves a lot more attention than it gets. But we'll see. So... The Nanny of Ellie Boyce, I think I think that's how you pronounce this, and again the link to the story will be in the description if you want to read it yourself or leave a comment, and I would also say that be constructive, if the story is not as good as it could be, be very constructive with your criticism, and do not harass the writer of the story at all, not everyone's J.C. Aina, not everyone's uh, Mr. Angry Dog, no one, not everyone deserves flack as long as their behavior is intact, but whatever. <clears throat> Here we go. Everyone dies, good or bad. Then what? Do we become some thoughtless nothing, incapable of missing life? Are we rewarded? People speak of near-death experience and exclaim that the afterlife is waiting gloriously. What about the evildoers? Do some experience agony, guilt, and burden when they peek across a veil? David was a portly man who made a very good living because he dressed, he was blessed with intellect. He married the first woman he fell in love with and, brought, and bought her a beautiful house. And despite that, he had the means to ensure she would not have to work. Okay. She would not have to work. And despite that he had the means to ensure Ellen, or as she was lovingly referred to in the house as Ellie, to the as she as whole household. I think household is one word. I, I think. I'm not entirely sure. Ellie had become pregnant without much effort, and made peace with the idea of being a working woman as well as a mother. David agreed that she should keep a work keep working, and since they had the money, a reasonable solution to events which may arise would be the hire a, a live nanny, Na t t the live-in nanny. Nanny should not be capitalized. And again, I'm, I hate to nitpick, but you know, you, you don't learn until sometimes if you're not told. Not just for the child, so that Ellie would not have to to slave over dinner and wash her sheets, or wash her sheets. Excuse me. So she could relax, or. Sloven, slovenly, I don't know that, I don't think there's a word, or slovenly relieve her husband during her home hours. They hired the first woman they interviewed. She seemed bright and intuition had been a fruitful decision maker for the young couple. Callie Atwood arrived at the house. When Callie Atwood arrived at the house, David thought her demeanor and poise could not be matched. Certainly not by the lineup of old grandmothers with faintly present accents of some land whose values did not appeal to David or Ellie Boyce. Racism. I kid. Old women who reek of perfume and makeup that rubs off of their bush em emblazoned coats when they st clumsily disrobe. You're kind of an asshole. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know, because I, I know I, I grew up knowing people like that. Fuck you. So Mrs. Atwood would be so Mrs. Atwood it would be, young, intelligent, and going into business for herself. 
They only discussed it briefly in the kitchen. David insisted that th she was the one, and Ellie agreed because Miss Atwood was not beautiful. Well, okay. Mrs. Atwood, Miss Atwood was not beautiful. She had a long, drawn face and had always been self-conscious that her small breasts made her body f resemble th that of an immature boy more than a woman. She was thin. If not for her pointed nipples, what? If not for her pointed nibbles, her spine and ribcage would be her most prominent features. How? Okay. And David began to notice this as time went on, and Ellie became more plump with his offspring. In her thirtieth year, Carly Atwood gave in to David Boyce, and he was, and he was the only the second man who had felt inside her and first the first for a long time oh god the only other man to touch her in her life before she knew was a thin paper doll with a twisted face what so she fell in love okay and when the baby came ellie took back her body and her husband she was unstoppable in her drive every day carly would swear ellie came home from work thinner, and she would swear David would come home with bigger eyes for his wife. And that little shit, they loved that little mess. When it cried, it peeled the nails off her, of her fingers, of off her fingers. Oh, a simple mistake. Mrs. Atwood would try to cook and fantasize about poisoning Ellen and growing a bastard of her own with David. Every day she thought of choke-cocking her, <laughs> of cocking her with razors and bleach, and she passed the time and fed the child twice a day, and shut in, shut it in a room otherwise. Uh. Hold on, sorry. I really wish. My laptop is not seen much better days. I'll say that much. I usually read this on a tablet so it's faster and it doesn't freeze every five seconds. Especially uh, so I don't have my mouse. Okay, I'm gonna have to cut a lot of this out. This pause and waiting. Anytime you're ready, you, know, you piece of shit. No, 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 yeah, go on, yeah, okay, uh, uh, you want to close the window, or do you want to, uh, yeah, thanks, Th no, thank you, no, seriously, no, I can't be any happier that you're not doing what I want you to do, okay, her fantasy was interrupted one day when she felt the weight of an, of an infant hand on her foot, Still and confused, she thought for a moment that God must be mocking her misery, because she was sure she had latched the be the child behind an old oak door. She thought about what a cruel trick this was, so he p she picked up the baby and dropped it into her churning pot of corn. She was validated that the hunger cries had been in vanity when she v vanity when she heard the fantastic wail of the ch child's full potential. The churning and crying stopped when the corn cooled, and all that was left was a muddy broth and Kathy Atwood sitting on the kitchen floor, alert and almost hungry. Ailey came home, and when Carly dove towards her, she bludgeoned her unconscious with a brass candle holder set on her set kitchen table. When David came home, Ailey was bathing in her arms in sweet corn. Bathing her arms in sweet corn and letting her child passed woman, and it was indisputable. And when she knew it was time for the baby to come, she went to the hospital. Waiting eagerly for assistance, a fire began to build in her stomach. She winced in pain, and the baby was audible. And when she screamed to drown out the noise, she felt her uterus smolder and wilt like a starving rose. Blisters on her stomach and thighs manifested, followed by a sharp punch prying her open. Water gave way and boiled brown. Her tissue scalded her legs and she was alone. 
Kathy Atwell was pronounced dead at the age of 31. She died in a coma. Technically, she was asphyxiated. Her malnourished body rejected supplements supplied by the caregivers, and her frame, thin frame could not support the feeding tube. A slurry pumped into her throat, and her tiny stomach blocked her way. And Ellie, Ellen Boyce was released on her manslaughter charge. Okay, that was awful. Um, besides the rather numerous spelling mistakes, and, and, and well, not numerous, they weren't that frequent. This, this is every, this is everything I hate about Creepypasta or some writers. The idea that this is supposed to shock me. It's done nothing but disgust me. The thing is, I need to be so engrossed in the story that this becomes uh, another part. Like, I can imagine this and be horrified that this is happening. Context is more rewarding to the reader's attention than any sort of over-the-top description of gore. And if I could grant one decent thing about the story is that the, the there is there is enough context to where I can understand the situation and the gore description of the gore itself was not that over the top and didn't put that much detail into it but the problem comes in again is this is one of those symptoms where the story is too short like uh the thing is the ki the baby itself is a prop and that's the thing I hate about the story it's a prop to shock the reader it's set up and we know at some point that this baby is going to die now, if you were intelligent about this, and this is why, like, look, this is a movie, and um, it's surprising how much similarities this movie has with that shitty creepypasta Laughing Jack. And the similarities are sounding like, uh, it's called The Babadook, and I, I've sung that movie's praise, and many people have sung that movie's praise, and you know why? Because it's one of the best horror movies that have come out in a long time, especially one that's getting mainstream attention. But the way that it kind of constructs it, like, at times I was uncertain that the child in that movie would die. And the times where I was more than certain that death was coming, I dreaded it because I had gotten to know that child. Like, we as the audience had gotten to know that child, and it got to the point where a lot, we didn't really want anything to bad to happen to him or his mother. Here, the child has no the infant has no character. It doesn't have a presence. It's a prop simply set up to shock the reader because it's going to die later on in a horrific way to kind of set up how messed up this lady is. And I really do hate it when story like a lot of these stories do that. I've I've seen a lot of stories, especially the worst example I've ever read was in Date Game. I think the dating game, and. To the point where I almost want to swear a few tirade. You'll, if you go listen to Overanalyst on his channel, he's going to post it at some point. Although he's promised to post it numerous times, but I don't harp on that, asshole. <laughs> but where it goes into great detail to describe a baby being poisoned, mutilated, and violently dismembered. And to the point where there is no punch it's just disgusting and it's not disgusting in the way that they want to revulsion like i can't quite explain it. there was i can't remember this tale like some something something's going places about the story about a comedian who was on a airplane and they described these boils on the the back of one of these passengers neck and the vivid detail and the choice of words made it sound as revolting as possible and that worked because it is one of those things complete like this is extremely against the norm basically that's one of the ways you could work it this right here and it's glanced over it's glanced over though it has relevance on the plot it's still glanced over like it was just another detail for the plot i really can't stand this so and the character of Carly, this doesn't feel like a natural escalation. If anything, I would argue that the uh, the last story I read, uh, what was it, uh, the story of Catherine, had a better sense of escalation than this story did, because at the very least we had gotten a not justifiable reason for her homicide, but 
it was a comprehensible one. Like, this is also comprehensible. Like, this woman was extremely jealous of her, uh, of her, and this is a situation that probably could happen, and there's a sense of horror to be had there, but the problem is also extends to the fact that we don't know the characters well enough to get invested in what happens to them. You need to take more time. The story needs to be longer. And I, I've said that a number, numerous amount of times. But the story needs to be longer so you can take more time to develop the characters and help us understand, like, like this guy, is, an, is he an average Joe who just got tempted? Like, it made really a, a, not that much sense that he would ch all of a sudden decide to cheat on his wife while she was pregnant. If it, like, you would think that the story would be long, uh, include this so detail, like, uh, as his wife got more pregnant, he found that, you know, he was sexually frustrated. Maybe work was starting to get to him. He saw that his nanny was attractive. He, he even described his nanny was, uh, in the, by the story's own admittance, rather homely. So, why would he even be attracted to her? Like, uh, there really is no logic here. There's no connecting point to make me understand the train of thought here. And I think, and like, it sounds like I'm nitpicking, but these are the kind of things that you really need to think about when you're reading, writing a story. And that's the key point. You're writing a story. And I know that sounds redundant for me to say that. You know, I'm like, no, duh, of course you're writing a story. Why would you, what else would you be writing? But, and I've even addressed this complaint when I was on the Overanalyst channel. The problem I had is in the stories that have been written it seems like their emphasis is being put more on trying to scare the reader by any means necessary rather than telling a story. If you want to frighten the reader and tell, you need to do both telling a story and, and use scare tactics. You need to do it both and meld them well, well enough to where it's organic. Here, this is just unnecessary gore. It's, it just kind of speeds through like a Japanese bullet train, and it really doesn't have enough time to really sit in. Like, the only part that sits in is the, is the gore, which I understand what is here, but it's, it doesn't have the punch it should. Because, again, we don't know the characters. We didn't get a chance to know her. We don't know what his wife, like, you briefly describe them. We don't see any interaction between the characters or even... even uh, like I've read certain stories before that were like this, but they built up on the growing frustrations between the characters and kind of made it clear that it was very uncomfortable. Like, uh, another story, it was on King Spook's channel. I actually listened to this story with my mother. Uh, it was about this woman who was a tenant, apparently, and she was a very wicked uh, monster of a person. And this one person who seemed to be able to... The only person that seemed to be able to get along with her. And we got to know her as a character. They took the time to kind of outline who she was and showed us glimpses of who she was as a person. She get, got us a backstory of how she used to treat her, uh, her daughter. And as we're listening to this, the, the plot twist, and I don't want to spoil it because you should go listen or read that story... Um, I don't know what it was, but someone will probably be able to tell me on the, uh, comments what story I'm talking about, because they might be able to recognize it. If I remember, I will put it in the description. But, it's built up on that so well, that the plot twist, it didn't necessarily come out of left field, but it had a stronger uh, impact on the reader and the listener, in this case, because I listened to him, because it was... One of those things where it was a sense of catharsis in what happened. It was, it felt like a natural, or like the story had a natural build up to what happened. This was just rubbish from start to finish. And there are two comments here, and I will read them. So, um, you know, I should start just linking these to the off the these so they can pretty much get the uh, thing. Um, so basically, I'm, so I'm going to post my own comment here and just linking it to my critique of this. Um, so one comment by uh, some guy. I'll read the this comment's too long for me to read. By banning by banning K nineteen seventy nine. This was well written grammatically and delivered well in quite a few areas. Let's take a closer look and review. 
One, you you developed your characters very well. I felt like I knew these people during the story. Well done. I disagree. You found the balance between while using gore. I disagree. You, I, this is pretty much going to be the entire thing. You didn't go over the top, yet you successfully described all the incidents in bite, nail biting detail. It, really, nail biting? Yeah. The ending felt jumbled, though. Carly killed the baby. Ellen came home and discovered the scene and attacked Carly. After that, I. However, you say that Carly was taken away after David called the police. Taken away is a common term for being taken to jail, so it seemed logical that Carly would have been arrested for killing the baby. However, he immediately jumped to her being pregnant and dying. And end story saying Ellen was, was released on her charges. So which was it? Who went to jail? If Carly went to jail, as most of us would assume she would, how does the next paragraph jump to write, write to her being pregnant? So what happened during her jail time? What was the outcome of the investigation? If Ellie went to jail, that needs to be explained. Was she charged with the baby's murder? Did the husband not defend her? Those things need to be clearer than that. Other than that, it was a good story. And uh, this is a response by the author. So, uh, I I really... T I, I don't know if I should read this. It's not that it was offensive or anything like that. It's just uh, I don't know if uh, I, I would sound as mocking. Um, hi, Benning. Thanks for the critique. Uh, uh, critique is... <laughs> And it is, a, it is a f understand, critic and critique are spelled completely different ways. I made that mistake a lot, but th yeah, this is for the author. Allow me to clarify some of the points outlined, and hopefully we can find the re resolution to improve the impact of the ending. In reference to the last bullet, bullet four bullets of your comment, Ellie knocks Carly unconscious with a candle holder and the police take her away. What is unsaid is that Carly, at this point, falls into a coma. What follows is Carly's inspiration conscious experience while in a coma while this is unsaturated by the number at preamble um, preamble about near-death experience for people who have done wrong in their lives as well as destruction of continuity I get what you're saying I really do get what you're saying and I, I, I gotta cut myself off and I really didn't uh, see this uh, see it at all but that doesn't make the story any more better. I forgot about the 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 uh, initial opening uh, sentence where pretty much talking about what happens when people die or like that was her going through something like a sort of experience in her coma. Like an okay, that's fine, but you need to make some kind of transition in. There was no transition into that. It's like you spoke of it in the same narrative as if it was something that legitimately happened. And it's not like, like I said before, I, I can't remember where it was, where uh, my critique at some point was that there needs to be a smooth transition into uh, insanity, where it makes us confused on what's really happening. And this, it wouldn't work here. I mean... You need to slightly change the narrative. Not even change the narrative. You need to kind of make it clear that... Or literally separate it. Separate the statements to... Or have some kind of weird transition. So we can understand that this is what may or may not be happening. Uh, you need, And even then, like, this is the one time where the description of the, the gore that's happening with her... And, you know, her stomach bursting open and whatnot... That is the one time where you should have gone into great detail. Because that, at the very least, would be some sense of catharsism. And it would be horrific in the sense of what's happening. But at the same time, it would be uh, one of the, the things that felt natural in the story. Like, this horrible thing is happening to her. And, um, you know, in her mind. And you do it in great detail, and it feels like this is she brought this on herself, even if it's not really happening. But her mind is pretty much being tormented with what's happening, and I don't really. Again, this doesn't really make the story any much better. This is a very much flawed story. To the writer who wrote this, and I'm going to look up his name right now. Um, John Ka John Cowling. On creepypasta.com, and I'm going to post my link, a link to this video in this comment box so we can hear this. Um, you have a decent, I think you have a moderately decent idea on your hands with this story. I understand where you're going with this because I've read stories like this before where, like, uh, you know, the tension, but the thing is, 
you did not really a brief description of a character does not constitute a character this is a this is one of those things where it's a, one of those uh you, you know this whole thing show don't tell and i your story kind of violated that and that's the reason why i could not get completely invested in the story and i'm not trying to 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 kind of undermine your, your skill here so uh hmm I I really don't have anything to say because I'm really hoping that Mr. Cowling or I don't know if that's his real name uh actually responds because I do want to open some form of discussion for this. The idea of random pasta critiques is that I pick a random pasta and whether it's good or not and I usually hope I find something good. This story was not one of those things, but Cowling seems like one of those guys that actually will listen to criticism and uh will try to learn from that so I hope that you take this all with a grain of salt and try to I hope you make a better story than this one and I'm not saying that to be an asshole I hope I legitimately hope you write the next be best thing to one of the better creepypasta out there you have certainly have potential I'll say that much so I look forward to whatever you write and uh, if I at all upset you with my critique then I apologize, that was not my intention, but this is legitimately how I feel. I feel that these criticisms that I have should be rectified for your next thing, and also, I can't stress enough, do not rely on... Do not rely on spe gore specifically to ignite shock. Like, gore in and of itself is... Again, the grotesque factor should not come from me... Should, I shouldn't feel disgusted with you as a writer for writing it. I should be feel disgusted that something like this horrible is happening to someone I care about. It's like, do not use infants or children as props in story just for stuff that's happening. You can excuse certain stories, like I think a Smile, what was it, uh, what was it called? Smile? I think Smiling Man or The Smile or something, or Teeth, I think it was Teeth, Mr. Teeth, I think it was called. Um... The difference between that story, it was just kind of giving passing descriptions on child abduction and it was kind of hinting towards child murder. We never really outright saw all in great detail what he would do to Joe. We have a like brief description from the narrator, but at the same time, it surfaced the plot in the sense that the narrator didn't see any of this. This is just what he heard from hearsay, so it makes sense that he would kind of gloss over it and he also out made it clear that he f always feels uncomfortable even thinking about it so just imagine what could have possibly happened to him you can imagine that he does not want to talk about it again so you know th 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 again context is key so this has been Vince 12 signing out and I'd stay tuned for another one of these because I actually do enjoy doing this Long live the Inquisition.